Good morning, Breakfast with Bacon fans. I am Dr. Christine Bacon, and I am excited to bring you today's guest. And I'm going to say, every time I know how to say something, I blow it because I say, oh, I know how to say Jim Papandrea. Jim, <laughs> Dr. Papandrea, did I say it right? Uh, it's Papandrea. Papandrea, see? Yeah, close enough, though. Close. Oh, um, but yeah, so he's written a book today. It's called The uh, Reading the Church Fathers. And um, before I tell you about that book, I want to say, I make sure I get all your titles correct. You're a Catholic professor, author, speaker, and musician. So I'll be curious what you play or sing. You have a Master's of Divinity from Fuller Theological Seminary, a PhD in History and Theology of Early Christian Tur Church from Northwestern University. And you're currently teaching as well, aren't you? Yes, I teach at the uh, the seminary that's on the campus of Northwestern University. What do you teach there? I teach uh, church history, early and medieval church history and historical theology. What do your students say? I was just teaching over it for past decades. So I yeah. love to know, what do you think your students say to you? Is like, this is great stuff or this stuff is too heady or what? Um, you know, I get every kind of reaction and um, my students are generally all Protestant. So, um, so a lot of them are um, perhaps they're having their eyes opened to the realities of early Christianity, what the early church was really like. And, uh, and, and I, I make them read the church fathers. I made them read the, the primary sources, the actual documents written by the church fathers. And um, so some of them uh, find it to be very surprising because uh, coming up in, in, a, in the Protestant world, and I know this from experience, I, I grew up in a Protestant denomination, you know, you're told a lot of things, uh, especially a lot of things about the early church that actually aren't it's true. true. And so, uh, so I'm, I'm playing Mythbuster a lot with my students. So just kind of jumping ahead, have you ever had students come to you and say, I think I'm going to convert to the Catholic faith or at least do some research into it because you've really tripped my trigger and I don't want to just listen to what I've heard, but really study it. Uh, I do on occasion have some who, um, who become very interested in Catholicism and uh, want to explore that more deeply. Um, you know, many of them are uh, young enough that they're still sort of finding themselves. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them are, of course, studying for positions of leadership in their own Protestant denominations, which, uh, you know, an actual conversion to the Catholic Church would mean a radical change in vocation mm -hmm. for uh, for most of them. But um but yeah, we, we do have those kinds of conversations from time to time. Can, before we talk about your book, how did you come to the Catholic faith? Well, you know, my story is not going to be surprising because if you're paying attention, uh, you will know people more famous than me who uh, came into the Catholic church through reading the church fathers. Um, you know, I was, I was actually baptized Catholic, so I guess I'm technically a revert, but revert, yeah. I, um, I was brought up in, in a Protestant denomination from, you know, before I was old enough to really, you know, think about it too much. So even though I was baptized uh, in, in a Catholic church, I was, uh, you know, went to catechism and was confirmed and all of that in the Lutheran denomination, uh, later found the Methodists on my own as a young adult, and was eventually ordained um, in the Methodist denomination. But I came back to the Catholic Church uh, when I got a PhD in the Church Fathers, when I read them for myself, when I studied the early church and found out what it was really all about, and uh, had an opportunity to study in Rome for a while. And uh, through all of those experiences, I came away thinking, well, I, you know, at this point, uh, there isn't even really a decision to make. I cannot not be Catholic, right? I, I, yes. I must be connected to, um, you know, the historic church in this way, so. Yeah, I usually um, hear from people who are fearful of the Catholic faith, things that they've been told, but that hadn't researched, you know, and, and so, you know, with all the grace that I can, that I can extend, I tend to say it's people who are afraid of studying even good and open minded people, because they're afraid it might convict them. Uh, you're going to learn some information. First of all, the silly things that you've heard about the Catholic faith are just not true. You know, many, yeah. many of those things that you've heard. So it's interesting because when you do do the studying, it can't not lead you to truth, which is. Yeah. I mean, I think so. I think that, uh, and, and now of course uh, it's terrible that I can't remember who said this, but you know, there is, there is a relatively famous quote that, you know, um, 
the, the things people don't like about the Catholic church are things that aren't true about the Catholic church. Exactly. In other words, that, you know, the, 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 uh, the things that, that are uh, the myths about Catholicism, mm -hmm. but, you know, I mean, I, I definitely grew up with those myths. I grew up with the idea that um, we worship Mary. Yeah. yeah. Well, that Catholicism had somehow ruined Christianity by adding all this superstition in the middle ages and that the Protestant reformation was somehow an attempt at getting back to a, a, a pristine sort of pre-Catholic Christianity. The problem is when you study the history of the church, you find out there is no such thing as pre-Catholic Christianity, right? It just doesn't exist. I mean, the early church is the Catholic church. And so once you realize that, then, um, then you've got a decision to make. But I will tell you that, you know, in the modern world, people do very often give themselves permission to see the truth and reject it, or to say, well, you know, maybe that's what they did in the early church, but see, we live in the 21st century, so we know better. And, uh, and so, so there's a lot of that too. Yeah. That's called cognitive dissonance. You know, we deal with that a lot. It's like, I, I see all the truth, but I'm going to explain away that. And this yeah. is why I'm well, staying the way I am. GK Chesterton called it arrogance. He said, it's, you know, it's the I'm arrogance. Being nicer. It's the, it's the, <laughs> it's the arrogance of discriminating against people who aren't living at this moment. Right. Yes. And, and, and not, not hearing their voice. Well, so let's go right into it because um, I just, I have a friend, doc, Dr. Barbara Nicolosi, actually she worked with, um, she was an advisor to Mel Gibson on the passion of the Christ. She is oh. also the screenwriter of Fatima movie. And so she goes to my church and she's teaching mystagogy and oh. she started out talking about the desert fathers. And I am a cradle Catholic. I have, always been Catholic, always loved my faith, never practiced anything else. I went through a period where I just wasn't practicing at all. But the point is, is she said the desert fathers. And I said, who are they? And I went to Catholic mm -hmm. school and she said, yeah, well, you know, that's the problem. And I'm like, it, the, the desert fathers especially can be a little bit obscure. Um, but, it, but in a very real way, they pioneer, um, the, you know, the, the kind of prayer that that later becomes called like contemplative prayer or uh, mystical uh, mysticism and um, and and there's there's a very important lesson to be learned from the desert fathers and and that is that humility is the key to everything right yeah. and um, I mean maybe I don't want to get off topic but I but you know too many people treat their prayers like they're giving God advice you know I'm gonna mm. when I pray I'm gonna tell God what to do. Uh, God doesn't need our advice, you know, and to approach God with, with the kind of humility that the desert fathers and mothers modeled, um, that's the key to prayer. That's the key to the spiritual life. Yeah. And who are the desert fathers? Abraham? Well, I mean, Moses? I mean, we're, when we talk about the desert fathers, we're talking about Christians. So um, in the, you know, within the church, but they are, um, ascetics, meaning, you know, they're, they're the, uh, the precursors to the monks and nuns. They're the pioneers of God. people who live um, apart from society in some way. And so uh, they, and they're also the pioneers of that very special vocation of, you know, to use the, the, the biblical uh, concept of watching and waiting. Remember Jesus's parable about the the, the wise bridesmaids and the foolish right. bridesmaids. And, you know, yes. Jesus talked about this idea of watching and waiting. Well, you know, for most of us in the church, our vocation is marriage and childbearing. And we participate in creation in that way. We participate in what God is doing in that vocation. But there are those who are called to a different vocation, which is specifically a vocation of celibacy Um and so they're not participating in creation by procreating, by having children, right. but they are participating in what God is doing in a different way, which is to say in that sense of watching and praying and waiting for the return of Jesus. It's a, it's a very, what we call it eschatological or sort of focused on, you know, the, the second coming and, and um, focused on the, the future redemption of the world. Um, and, and so it's a different vocation and the desert fathers and mothers were those Christians. And we're, you know, we're talking about like starting maybe in the, the third and fourth centuries AD, uh, there are those Christians who, who sort of, uh, detach themselves from society and from, even from some social relationships and, and look for a sort of radical union with God, um, 
through that. Now, my book is more general. When we talk about the church fathers, we're talking much more generally. Now, that includes the desert fathers, but the church fathers in general, and, and there are a few church mothers too, uh, these are the, the bishops, the theologians, the catechists, and their older sisters and mothers sometimes, and the martyrs who wrote documents, um, documents we can still read, who become an example for us. We, most of them, we call them saints. Um, but, uh, but these are the people in the, in the time of early Christianity who really helped us define for us what Christianity itself is and what the church is. It's a very exciting time. Um, and I mean, I'm, even though I've been doing it all this time, I'm still passionate about it, as you can tell. Yes, which is awesome, because if you're not passionate about them, it's not going to come out in your writing. And what really got me is reading that in the early, you know, reading the church fathers talking about the histories is that they were dealing with shockers, heresies, schisms, persecutions, excommunications. And I thought, you know, my reading about 2022, because we're doing that right now. We're dealing with that. And I know there's a lot of people that talk to me and who have been on my show, Jim, and they're like, this must be the end times because look at these things we're dealing with. But then when you kind of go back and you realize, well, you know, hold on, these things have been happening forever, you know, since the beginning of the church. So um, can you kind of take us there? So what are there patterns that we're seeing throughout the history of the church that were or, or the things that happened back then and maybe are happening now, was there ever a period of church history where those things weren't happening? Can you kind of kind of paint that line for us? Well, sure, I'll, I'll try. Um, you know, uh, before Jesus ever walked the earth, a wise man said, there is nothing new under the sun, right? And that is, that is never more true than now because all of the heresies that are around now yeah. are really just repackaged versions of heresies that have been around since the beginning of, of the church. Um, and a lot of them center around things like questioning the divinity of Jesus Christ and, mm -hmm. you know, things like this. Um, and I, and I talk about that stuff in my book. Um, but what's interesting is this, you know, we, uh, those of us who are old enough to remember, we can remember a time when you could assume, especially in, let's say North American culture, you could assume that the culture was basically Christian and that Christian values had influenced our society to a certain extent, right? Well, those days are over. And I, you know, I mean, I can't tell you when they ended exactly, but they're pretty much over. And we now live in a time when to be a faithful Christian, a faithful Catholic, one has to be countercultural. And in that way, I think we have, we have actually come full circle to the way it was in the time of the early church, when Christianity was illegal, when speaking up for Christian values meant that the world was going to call you unenlightened and backwards and, uh, you know, closed-minded and rigid and all of these yes. kinds of things. And so, you know, all of the, you know, whether it's, persecution or just kind of a subtle marginalization, all of those kinds of discriminations that faithful Christians and faithful Catholics um, are experiencing now, all of that was around at the beginning when Christianity itself was illegal. And we may be moving in that direction again, I don't know, but, um, but you know, it's almost like when we, when we think, oh my gosh, you know, it's getting so bad, it's getting so bad. I mean, that's true, but it's also partly because we were spoiled for a while in the sense that yeah. we could we could feel like we lived in a world where we didn't have to be countercultural. Um, that world is gone, and we do have to be countercultural now. Yeah, that is a really good way of phrasing it, because I, I kept saying, we're no longer in a Christian society. We're no longer in a post-Christian society. We are actually in and entering into an anti-Christian society. So you really kind of, you know, opened my mind when you said we are you're coming full circle because you're right. If I look back in church history, this is exactly how the church started, right? When Jesus, I mean, Jesus was tortured and died and that's so right. Started with him. And so did the apostles tortured and died, except for John, you know, that, that's right. And Jesus himself said, you know, don't be surprised when this happens to you. Um, so yeah, in a in a very real sense, post-Christian looks very much like, uh, like not pre-Christian, but 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 the time in the Christian church before 
uh, let's say the Roman Empire was converted, you know, and uh, so so it's, you know, we, we are in some sense kind of coming full circle back mm-hmm. to the way we started as a church. Well, so, okay, take us to this. You're passionate about this. So today, again, we're talking about your book, Reading the Church Fathers. What is some of the most exciting stuff that you found when, I mean, this journey of yours, I'm sure has been decades, you know, because you didn't just yeah. get your knowledge overnight, but something was so passionate or, you know, impassioned in you that you needed to write about it. So what are some of the really rich things about our church, reading our church fathers that you think our viewers would be interested in hearing? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, as, as a Protestant coming back to the Catholic Church, I mean, one of the things that that really hit me hard, and I and I wasn't opposed to it, I was ready for it, but it still hit me, mm-hmm. was just how much the early Christians from the beginning did believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, right? That our Eucharistic, our sacramental theology has been the church's sacramental theology from the beginning. And the Protestant Reformation, um, and, and, and it's the, the farther one goes into the Reformation, the more this is true, the Protestant Reformation turned the sacraments more and more into things people do, rituals, rites of passage, commemorate, commemorating something that already happened, like, you know, I, I accepted Jesus as my savior last week, so now I'm going to get baptized, you know, sort of commemorating a past event. Catholic and you know, by Catholic, I mean historic Christian sacramental theology is that the sacraments are not primarily something people do, but yes. the sacraments are something God is doing in that moment, yes. right? So, so that's one thing I would say for sure. Um, another thing that I think uh, maybe you know, Catholics sort of have the sense that you know this is obvious to them, but I don't think we really uh, emphasize it enough, and that is that. Um, there, there is a, a Protestant doctrine known as sola scriptura, which mm-hmm. is Latin for scripture alone. alone. And again, mm-hmm. same kind of thing. The farther you go down the path of the Protestant Reformation, the more this becomes true and the more the doctrine of sola scriptura becomes a kind of a like a fundamentalist uh, reading of scripture where, um, you know, everything you need for the Christian faith is is somehow supposed to be in the Bible. Right. And one of the things you find out when you study the early church is that no Christians ever believed that for the first 1500 years of Christianity. Sola Scriptura not only never existed in the early or medieval church, it doesn't exist in the Bible either. And when you see that, there's like this light that goes off over your head that is to say, there's this doctrine that says, you know, I can only believe what's in the Bible, but that doctrine itself is not in the Bible. And so it's the Bible actually says the opposite, right? right exactly. The Bible it's, says you you have to pass on what I've given you in that's right. writing and in word, you know. That's right. It's it's um it's self-contradictory. And um and and yet, you know, when I was coming up again in a Catholic church, I, I'm sorry, when I was coming up in the Protestant denomination, you know, there are these myths out there. And one of the you know, one of the things that I was told was that, oh well, you know, during the Middle Ages. Uh, Catholic Church didn't want people to think for themselves, and so they wouldn't let you read the Bible. And so here comes the Protestant Reformation as this sort of great Saviors, you know, yeah. savior, right? Putting the Bible in the hands of the people. None of that is true, right? Uh, first of all, the Catholic Church has no problem with you thinking for yourself, right. but there is a problem with you thinking by yourself, if that means apart from the church and apart from the received tradition. Because as it turns out, all heresy is the result of trying to interpret scripture apart from tradition, right? And yeah. on your own. And Peter himself said, no interpretation of scripture is a matter of one's own opinion, right? And, uh, and, and so, you know, all of that is to say that, you know, this, this whole concept of, of, especially the way like, for example, fundamentalist Christians today might interpret the idea of sola scriptura, you know, it's in the grand scheme of things, it's a pretty new concept. It's not in the Bible, and it certainly isn't found uh, in the early or medieval church. And then, you know, this this myth that the Protestant Reformation was about putting the Bible in the hands of the people, it never did that, right? All it did was take try to take the Bible away from the church and hand it over to the state and, and, and handed it over to the scholars of state-run 
uh, universities. And, you know, that, that created all kinds of problems. So um, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of myths out there that need to be sort of uh, debunked about the yeah. history of the church and, you know, what was going on in the Middle Ages, um, what led to the Reformation and all of these things. Yeah, I really like it because I don't want to insult my Protestant brothers and sisters, but I do want to, you know, clarify and uh, Father Mark Riley, he's a Catholic priest in New York, and he and I had done some missionary work together. And one thing he said, it just made things so clear to me. He said, no Protestant religion was ever formed based on any new knowledge of Christ, the church or scripture, he said, but rather by stripping away that which they did not like or did not agree with. And I was like, ooh, that kind of, you know, speaks of what St. John the Baptist was doing is like, I'm not going to create it. This is truth. We're going to stick by truth. And, you know, whether you like it or not. And I was like, you're right. So let's stick with the unpleasant parts of the truth as well. And then let's work at it from there. So, um, yeah, no, that's, that's very true. In fact, you know, in order for them to do that, to strip away the things that they were uncomfortable with, um, they actually had to remove some of the books of the Old Testament, right? So they had to take out the Maccabees because, you know, there's witness there to purgatory, um, well, purgatory and the intercession of the saints and, and you know, several things. And, and, uh, and they had to remove books like Tobit and Wisdom, which, by the way, Jesus himself refers to in the Gospels. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a problem that, you know, like sort of like once you start pulling, it's like a, a thread on a sweater. Yeah. Once you start pulling that that thread, the whole thing unravels if you're not careful. So. I never really remembered that, but Jesus did refer to Tobit, right? Did he refer to the Book of Wisdom as well? Uh, I believe so. And I've got in the book some uh, footnotes on that. So uh, I can, I can uh, if, if people check the footnotes, you can see where in the Gospels Jesus is referring to these um you know, we might call them deuterocanonical books, or some people call them apocryphal, but that's not really correct. But, right. but you know, these, those, those books like Tobit and Wisdom that are, uh, that are not in the Protestant Bibles. Because you studied this, I would be curious to hear your perspective. I've heard people say that Luther pulled out of the Bible. Um, he, he was at a debate, and they were asking him questions about things like purgatory, for instance. And so, oh, uh, let me take Maccabees out of the Bible, because it's not there. I don't think that it would be so... Um, basic like that, that let me just strip them out. Uh, what are your, uh, what is your understanding of the reasons that those seven books were removed from the Protestant Bibles based on your well, study? It, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a complicated story and I, I do go into it in the book, but um, St. Jerome, who uh, was trying to update the Latin translation of the Bible, went back and forth on whether to include the Old Testament books that were never written in Hebrew, that were originally written in Greek. And um, when he didn't include them, St. Augustine rejected his translation. And, uh, and, and so even what we know as the Vulgate is not really the, the product of all of, uh, it's not entirely Jerome's work. But so when Martin Luther and some other reformers came along and they wanted to, they were uncomfortable with some of these books, they wanted to remove them. They could, they could claim as a precedent St. Jerome because they said, oh, well, these were not originally written in Hebrew. Um, and and it was, it's a slow progression. I mean, basically, they first, you know, put them in a separate section, like in between the Old and the New Testaments. Mm -hmm. Then they put them in a separate section at the end of the Bible. And then, you know, then they were removed from the Bible altogether. Right. So it was, it was more of a progression than that, you know? Okay. Yeah. Cause it didn't seem, I mean, I thought even as a Catholic, I just, it didn't seem to make sense. Well, I, that was under, I don't let me, let me take it out. I'm like, ah, I don't think people yeah. would just let him yeah. take them out like that. So I figured that had to be a different understanding. Well, they, they let him do a lot of things, but again, you know, uh, Luther was, it was only kind of one of the first steps on this trajectory of the Protestant Reformation, right? So even Martin Luther um, wasn't—he he wasn't too uncomfortable with our Eucharistic theology. He wasn't too uncomfortable with the Marian doctrines. But you know, each phase of the Reformation chipped away at more things Something until else. you get the, the so-called Radical Reformation, saying, "Well, you can't baptize infants and all of these things." So it's a—it's a progression. That the Eucharist isn't the Eucharist is just bread and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So take us on a journey of, of your book, the reading the church fathers then. So what's kind of like this history in the book going from? Well, you know, I start almost immediately after the time of Jesus. Um, 
And uh, in fact, there is a section in the book on uh, our New Testament and how we got that and you know how the church fathers, they, they were the ones who chose which documents would be included in the New Testament, right? And so there's a section on how we, how we got that. And, um, and I start from there and I, and I really focus a lot on the documents that we still have from the time of the early church. So we still have some documents that are contemporary with the New Testament documents. We have a letter from one of the first bishops of Rome, Clement. We have this letter, we call it First Clement. That's very clever, isn't it? But uh, <laughs> First Clement was written about the same time as the book of Revelation. Those were written at almost exactly the same time, probably the same year. Um, there's something called the Didache, which is an early church manual, which talks about baptism and Eucharist. It's, 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 a, it's a hugely important document. That may have even been written earlier. That may be contemporary with, uh, with the Gospel of Matthew, for example. So, um, so I start from the beginning and just talk all the way through the, the important documents and who wrote them. And, and by the way, this book is written for anyone to read it. I, I assume that if you're reading this book, you're starting from scratch. So you do not need any prior knowledge in the early church or the church fathers to understand this book. It's, it's written to just completely start from the beginning and, and, and go through the story and catch you up. And um, I, I mean, I treat it like, like it's, a, it's a very exciting story. Because you're a teacher. You're good yeah. at teaching. So you could teach a blonde too, right? I can teach uh, anyone and uh, I'm not going to go down that road, but <laughs> I'm allowed to, I'm allowed you can. To. <laughs> yeah. But that is, you know, that's exciting to me because I, I want, I just had my son-in-law question me on some of the things that you just mentioned, you know, well, who decided what books went in, who decided which books didn't. And, you know, why are we not listening to the other ones? And I said, well, because they, they didn't all agree. Well, then maybe we should have listened to them. And I'm like, I, have a PhD, Jim, but not in early church history. So I'm yeah. like, you know, I'm only going to give you a weak understanding of it because that's not my area of expertise, but go and, and study with the people who have, who have that expertise. And it explains, you know, why we chose these books. Um, so the Didache you said was written, it's, a, it's its own document. It was written yeah. right around the time of the gospels. Uh, yeah, I think so. Now, you know, there, there's, uh, scholars debate over when we should date this document because nowhere in the document does it say exactly when it was written. So um, the early end of the date range could be, you know, the, the the seventies or so of the first century. The late end could be into the second century, but um, it's it's definitely contemporary with you know like the later New Testament documents. Right. So um, yeah, and it was considered very valuable. Um, but what you have to understand is the, the church fathers did make a distinction between documents that are inspired and documents that are valuable, but not necessarily inspired. And then, of course, there's another whole category of documents that were forgeries or fakes or, right. you know, fringe documents that nobody should read. Um, and so they, they understood all these things and they sorted these things out. And that's how we end up with our New Testament. So how do we determine if we read this book, will, will someone like me be able to go, oh, okay, so these are some documents that I want to go read now in addition to the Bible? Does it help us understand those? Oh, sure. Yeah. In fact, that's kind of the one of the whole points of the book so that um, I use it for my intro class, for my uh, introduction to church history. And I actually assign uh, my students to read some of these early church documents. So my students will read First Clement. And so they'll read in my book, the section where I tell you, well, who is Clement? What was, what was the context? Why did he write this document? And then if people want to, they can go actually read his own writing and you can hear him in his own words. And it, it's exciting because not only do you have these really early church fathers that you can read in their own words, and it's completely accessible. Anyone can understand this stuff, but we also have some early church mothers too. And we have some very important documents where you can hear a woman in her own voice. Right. Um, we have the diary of, of St. Perpetua, and uh, we have a pilgrimage diary of a woman named Egeria. So again, I talk about these documents in the book, and if people want to, they can find them on the internet, or they can buy them in books, and they can read them for themselves. What does the church say about Perpetua? I know she's a saint. 
I mean, what, so they say about these documents. So here's just kind of like, let's go deep into an area there. So it wasn't chosen to be in the Bible. So it's not divinely inspired. Well, right. And, and I mean, when it comes to the earliest Christian documents, uh, it, it, the, the choice of what made it into our New Testament has a lot to do with authorship. So if something was written by a disciple of Jesus or a close associate, a disciple of one of those dis- disciples, right? you got to be that close to Jesus. So, like Paul. Right. So, so Paul, of course, anything written by Paul is going to make it in the Bible. And I, I joke with my students that if, you know, if we had Paul's grocery list, you know, it, it, uh, it would be in the New Testament. Right? <laughs> but, um, but the, but yes, so Peter, you know, uh, and, and then like someone like Mark is a sort of second tier disciple, right? And, and you could argue Paul is in a way too. Um, but then once you get beyond that sort of circle, um, people are, are too far down the road. Uh, their writings are valuable, but they're not necessarily inspired in the same way. Right. And so we have, we have the, for example, the second century uh, theologian named Irenaeus. He mm-hmm. was Bishop of Lyon in France. He wrote some really important theology that helps us interpret scripture. But he also wrote some things where he got his dates wrong and he made some historical mistakes about what had happened before he came on the scene. So he's not inspired. Uh, His writings are not considered scripture, but they're super important for us to understand. Um, And so so the church fathers, we don't consider them inspired in the way we would think of uh, biblical writers, but where they, where they give us a consensus, where they agree, that becomes the tradition of our church. And so it is authoritative in that sense. Now, someone like Perpetua, she lived in the third century. So she's a little farther down the road, um, too late to be included in the New Testament. Um, but she's important because she was martyred for her faith. She and her whole catechism class were arrested simply for converting to Christianity, and they were executed in uh, the arena in Carthage in North Africa. And while she's in prison awaiting her martyrdom, she kept a diary. And and that diary was saved and preserved and uh, someone published it and we still have it. And of course it's been translated into English so anyone can read it. It's an amazing document. And um, and so uh, Perpetua is considered a saint. Uh, she would be simply because she was martyr. martyr. Right. But she also has, she, she's also a kind of a mystic because she has these uh, mystical visions uh, that she describes in her writing as well. So um, it's, it's fascinating stuff. And I was just going to uh, say, you know, you listen to the title, Reading the Church Fathers. It's not an exciting title, <laughs> well, but this, this <laughs> richness that you're giving is like, I, I don't know if my viewers are doing the same thing, but I'm like, oh, I want to read that. And I want to read that. And I, I've read the Bible on my, my fourth time through and I feel like these would be such great supplemental new knowledge. Of course, I'll never memorize the Bible and you know how that is. It lives forever and you can always learn from it. So there is no way I'm comparing anything to the Bible, but you know, the magisterium and the other documents that um, can help fill in the, is it fair to say fill in the blanks? Is that, or is that like, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, Or I would even go farther than that. I would say, those are the things that help us understand the Bible, that help us interpret the Bible. As I always tell my students, the history of the early church is the history of the early Christians trying to understand revelation. So the primary revelation of God to humanity is, of course, the incarnation, Jesus himself, and then the New Testament, right? Our Bible. And so, um, but, you know, the, the Bible doesn't really interpret itself. I mean, you know, I I know that the the fundamentalists will tell us that, oh, the, you know, all the meanings right there on the surface. Right, right. It's not. Uh, It needs to be interpreted. And the church fathers are the ones who help us understand it, who help us interpret it, because they're the ones closest in time to Jesus and the apostles who are reading the same scriptures we are and who are interpreting them and they help us understand them. And so when we read the church fathers, like for example, Irenaeus of Lyon, we're reading a brilliant theologian unpacking the scriptures for us and helping us understand what they mean. The Bible came about 
you know, as a book. Um, I know the printing press helped make it, you know, here we go. But the last book was put together and the group of people said, this is the Bible in what year? Well, yeah, so that that's a huge question. And unfortunately, there is no easy answer to it. It's really a kind of a dynamic process. Um, in the second century already, you have uh, you have uh, copyists who are who are copying collections. And if you were wealthy enough and you wanted to buy one of these collections, you could buy a collection of the four gospels. You could buy a collection of Paul's letters, right? You could buy collections of the other letters or whatever. Um, but it, but it took a while for the church to really nail down in any sort of universal consensus, which documents were officially for the whole church, the authoritative documents. I go through that in the book. Um, but you really cannot point to any one council or any one moment where say, ah, now we have a Bible. It was a very dynamic right. process. Um, by about the fourth and into the fifth century, you have some popes who weigh in on the subject. And then you have letters from these popes who, who lay out, you know, the, these are the books of the New Testament. And yeah, that's the New Testament. But even so, there were some Eastern Christians who weren't necessarily listening to the popes. And, but as late as the seventh century, we almost had a situation where our Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters might not have had the book of Revelation in their Bibles. They were very skeptical about that book for a long time. Of course, they finally did include it. And thankfully, all Christians now have the same New Testament. Even if, you know, the Protestants don't have all the Old Testament books, all Christians have the same New Testament, thank God. Um, but that almost wasn't the case. So it was a very dynamic process. And, um, you know, it, it, it takes a while to tell the story. But it's an exciting story. It is exciting. I'm sitting here going, boy, I want to read. There's just so much of this I'm wanting to read. So, so again, this is kind of like going to my Protestant brothers and sisters who are like, well, you know, the Bible was here and, and you got to follow the, the soul of scripture of people. Right. So there is a period of time where these, I'll pick a little, this and this letter and perpetuas and this Clemens, um, that they were just living off of the magisterium, the word of mouth. And do you address that? Like, what is the magisterium and how is this word of mouth, this oral history yeah. that we passed on? Right. Um, I don't, I don't talk about the magisterium per se, because that's a little bit more of a modern concept, even okay. though obviously it exists throughout the whole history of the church. Um, but in the early church, I talk about it in, um, in the sense of what we call apostolic succession, right. which is the handing down of the tradition from one generation to the next. And so the assumption, even before there is a New Testament, the assumption is that, you know, the average Christian can trust what's being taught and preached in their parish because their parish priests are teaching under the authority of their bishop. And their bishop is in this line of succession, going back to the previous bishop and the previous bishop, all the way back to the apostles and to Jesus himself. And so, you know, the, the, the theory is that, you know, the, the tradition is preserved down through the generations of this succession of bishops. Now, of course, there were bishops who disagreed, and I talk about that, and there are checks and balances for the whole concept of apostolic succession. Um, but what people don't really realize and what I think we have to emphasize is apostolic succession came before the New Testament. And the New Testament is a product of the church's tradition, not the other way around. Mm. The, you know, if you sit here and think in awe, you know, Jesus touched Peter and Peter touched um who's the next one linus who's your next pope uh right there's linus and, and then, anacletus and and then, uh, and then clement right yeah yeah so so you know right. one yeah. touched he put his hands on him and he put his hands on the next and he put his hands and here we are two thousand years later and that hand touch it's kind of like when you're a kid on the playground you're like electricity did you ever play that as a kid sure you know? yeah right yeah. and and, and it's we, like, this yeah. is what we have. It doesn't mean that each of our bishops or cardinals or priests are perfect. I mean, so many of them have been heretics and have had, right. you yeah. know, but, but this is, I'm passing this on to you and you have this responsibility to pass on what you've learned to win souls. It's just that to yeah. win souls. Right. 
and, and it gets it, this gets back to what I was saying about uh, sacraments too, because in the sacrament of holy orders, right, the authority is passed down from one generation of leadership to the next in a way that is sort of uh, guaranteed by by God's grace. Like God is at work. And, you know, I see e even in my students, sometimes I see um, sometimes the idea of ordination is talked about as though, well, you know, this person has these gifts for ministry and the church is going to recognize those gifts. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's not the whole story, right? Because in our, in our sacramental theology, um, ordination isn't just recognizing someone's talents, but it is infusing that person with a grace it's that a is Pentecost going to enable yeah. and empower them to do a ministry that they couldn't do without that laying on of hands, right? Mm. And so that is exactly, you know, it's, you know, the Peter touched the next guy who touched the next guy, but in ordination, in the sacrament. Yeah. So it's super important to, to think of it that way. Yeah. I love it. Just uh, the holiness of it. So, so, okay, this is exciting to go through this. And I, I wish I could tell my viewers that I was able to read the whole book, but I wasn't, I could only go through part of it. Um, so what will we find as we go through, like at the end of the book, is it kind of like, wh what will we hope to gain? Cause you're a teacher, I'm a teacher and I'm always letting my students say, okay, so here's what you get. So is this like, and this is the rest of the story or here's where we got you and then go off now and spread the gospel. You know what I mean? Yeah. What were you taking us? Well, it, it, the, uh, so the book is called reading the church fathers. And then the subtitle then is a history uh, of the early church and the development of doctrine. And so I talk about how the early church clarifies. We, we use the phrase development of doctrine, but we, we don't mean that it changes over time. We mean that it's, that it's clarified over time. And, um, and especially as the, uh, the mainstream or the, the, the orthodox expression of the church clarifies doctrine in opposition to the heresies. So I talk about all the heresies and how the church clarifies its doctrine in opposition to the heresy. And as time goes on, that clarification becomes fuller and fuller, you might say. Um, and one of the things you're going to find out in the book is that, you know, the heresies all in their own way chip away at our hope of union with God, chip away at our hope of salvation. And so by the time I get towards the end of the book, I do a little bit of sort of looking ahead to the Middle Ages and how, again, it comes full circle, talking about why orthodoxy, why correct doctrine is necessary and, and the medieval theologians said it was necessary for salvation to even be possible. Because, you know, sometimes I have students come into my class and they wonder, well, what, what, what's the big deal? Why does it matter? Like, why can't the church just let everybody believe whatever they want? And the answer is because not every belief leads to reconciliation with God. Hmm. Not every belief leads to salvation. And so, you know, someone who reads this book will, by the end of the book, understand why that's the case and how that plays out. So um, yeah, the book's not short, but it is really accessible. Anyone can read it. I've written it so so anyone can read yeah, it. Yeah. And I would I would think because you're a teacher and because you do get good feedback from your students, I mean you can't teach college students and keep your job if you suck at communicating the message. So you have to be able to speak at uh, you know, a normal people level because they hear PhD and they think you're going to be all heady and, you know, and, and one of the, my goals when I got my doctorate was, and I didn't realize this was something I had always said it, but I said, I want, there was always this lofty intellectual knowledge that I would hear the, the really smart people talk about, but it never touched me because I'm like, it's too far up there. And so when I got mine, I was like, my gifting is taking lofty intellectual stuff and making it, as you've said, accessible. Yeah. Here's what it means because I'm always saying now what, and I'm actually question you this. I end all my shows the same way that I end all my classes and my seminars, you know, like, okay, what can we do? What can we do about this information? Because having knowledge is one thing, but what do we do with the knowledge that's going to change us? Or in our case, both you and me get, get us to heaven because that's the goal, right? Yeah, I, I think so. And of course, um, you know, my students are actually uh, preparing for, uh, their own various ministries in, you know, various Protestant denominations. Areas, yeah. And so, um, so I want them to 
be able to teach their people the true doctrines of the church. I don't want them to get up in their pulpits on Trinity Sunday and preach heresy, right? I want mm -hmm. them to be able to, uh, to teach. And in, in a certain sense, everyone, what did Peter say? You know, we should all be ready to give a reason for the hope that is within us, right? And, and so I would hope that from reading my book, anyone who read, reads it would be um, more informed about their own faith and about, you know, what, what we believe as, as Christians yeah. in general and Catholics in particular, and, um, and able to talk about the faith and also able to engage in a more personal way in the liturgy, in mass. You go to mass and you will understand more uh, concretely yeah. what's going on in the mass, it? what the priest is talking about, why we do the things we do, uh, why are the other sacraments important, um, and, uh, and, and, you know, that, that whole kind of big picture thing. Well, I can't read. I really can't wait to read this now because you have peaked my, this is where I am right now, but being able to explain those things, because I'm known as a person with a big mouth and I talk my faith, but now people are asking me deeper and deeper questions. And that's where I'm like going, well, ask Dr. Papin, how am I going to say it wrong again? Papandria? Papandrea. Papandrea. Yeah, yeah well, that's accent. right. That's because I'm right. like, I, I don't have, I'm here. And now we're, you guys are asking me here. We need to go further. But th that's great, right? People need right. to keep going further and further. And we all have those friends, relatives, coworkers who are uh, not Catholic, not Christian, not anything. Um, and, and they want to sort of justify themselves by, by throwing what they think are hard questions at us. We need to be ready to answer those questions. Yeah. This is kind of a random question. It's not really though. Doing all of this research your whole life, you know, getting degrees in this stuff, teaching it, writing this book. Do you have a favorite one or two or three church fathers? Well, you know, I actually get that question a lot. And oh, do you? It's, okay. Cool. Yeah, it's it's hard to pick. I did my dissertation on a, a guy named Novation, uh, Novation of Rome, who is not technically considered a church father because he caused a schism, uh, but his his writings are very profound and doctrinally he helps us understand the doctrine of the trinity in a way that no one had done before him and i kind of get him because he's he's a little curmudgeonly and i, I don't know I, I i think i feel like i i know him i spent so much yeah. time with him but um irenaeus is super important uh there's another guy named tertullian who also so i tend to gravitate towards those church fathers who uh, are kind of like milestone theologians in promoting and clarifying our understanding, especially with regard to the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, but uh, but beyond that, I, I don't know that I can choose. I, all I know is this: when we sing the Liturgy of the Saints or the Litany of the Saints yeah. in certain uh, in certain masses, I sometimes I get choked up. I can't get through it because we are singing for these saints to pray for us. And I feel like I know them because I've read their words and I've spent yeah. time with them. And, um, and so, yeah, I feel very connected to them. Mm, that is true. It's like singing the litany instead of, you know, Peter, Paul, and some pray for us. It's like grandma, mom, and aunt, you know, <laughs> yeah, Elizabeth right. pray for us, dad, uncle Jim pray for <laughs> us. You know, it's like, wow. Okay. Right. Um, but, but when we get to ones like, you know, Athanasius and some of the ones, maybe people are thinking, who's this guy? I know these guys because mm -hmm. I've, I've read their works and I, yeah. So it's. Wow. Well, deal. here's a similar question then. Who are some of the women that we will learn about? Cause we hear about the church fathers. Who are mm -hmm. some of the church mothers that we may not have even been aware of that, you know, right now I get this feminism thing. Right. Let me go look, look at these women who led to where we are today. Yeah. Well, you know, so there's Perpetua and there is uh, this woman, Egeria, and they are two extremely important women because we actually get them in their own voice. Like we get to read something they wrote. Like Perpetua's diary. Right. Uh, there are other women who are important, even though they didn't write anything that we have. Uh, Macrina is, um, I'm looking at my notes here. Where is, where is it? Um, yeah, so uh, Macrina the Younger, that's what I want to double check, because there's a Macrina the mm -hmm. Younger. Macrina the Younger was the older sister of St. Basil. Now, uh, Basil and his brother Gregory, these guys, fourth century bush bishops and monks, Basil is considered the, the father of Eastern monasticism, and his first catechist was his older sister, Macrina. 
And she is the one who promoted the monastic life in their house. She's the one who talked to their widowed mother into converting their estate into a convent and welcoming women who would otherwise be homeless or destitute. Um, and so she, even though we don't have anything she wrote, she's extremely important. And uh, Gregory wrote uh, her life and wrote another really important document where she is presented as, as his teacher. So, uh, so St. Monica, uh, the, the mother of St. Augustine, is also extremely important in forming Augustine. And, it, you know, I, I make the case that she becomes in his, in St. Augustine's book, The Confessions, his mother Monica is like the personification of God's grace, following him until he gives in, right? You know, <laughs> she followed him all over the, mm -hmm. all over the Mediterranean world. So, um, yeah, so there's, there's some really very interesting women. There's some very powerful women, some very wealthy women who, who founded um, monasteries and, um, yeah, it's, it's wow. a great story. Well, then let me kind of take us to the end here. Um, name one thing you would have our viewers do differently as a result of something they heard today. And I'll, besides buy the book, because I'm going to say that, buy the book and read it. One thing you'd have them do differently. I would say, don't believe what you hear or what people tell you about early Christianity or even medieval Christianity. Um when you hear all the negative stuff, um, you know, whether it's anything from, you know, if, if you hear people say the hierarchy of the church developed so that, you know, old white men in tall hats could hold on to their money and power, or whether you hear somebody complain, oh, the Crusades, the Inquisition, don't believe any of it until you check it out for yourself or until you read some trusted author, um, because the story is, it's, it's more complicated and it's actually a happier story than all that. Uh, and, uh, and, and when you read the story, you will have a newfound appreciation and love for your faith and your church. Hmm. That is exciting. You're right. Just do the research yourself. Um, you know, at our church, the Barbara Nicolosi, who I was telling you, she's doing that Mr. Gaji program. And I didn't think my husband would be interested, but it's, it's been really sucking us in because it deals with a lot of these topics that you're dealing with. And you're right. You're never too old. You're never too Catholic. You're never too Protestant. You know, we have no, when we stand before God, we will have no excuse for not finding out more. If I don't give someone the proper answer and God says, yeah, but I gave you access. I introduced you to Jim Papan, Papandria, Papandria, right. Yeah. Um, and, and you could have read that. And so it's that kind of thing is no matter who you are, we, you're not dead, you know, so keep yeah. on growing and keep on maturing. This is totally going to sound off. This is off the book, right? Um, fill in the blank. I, when I die, I will know my life has been a success if. Wow. I know. Uh, deep, huh? you, you know, you'd, you'd think I would have, uh, you think, you think I would have an answer for that. Um, you know, I think, when I die, I will know my life has been a success if other people um, miss me and want uh, to be a little bit more like me in in certain ways. But um, and and maybe if if I'm if I'm really fortunate, maybe there will be more people in heaven because of me um, because I led people back to the church. Hmm, that is really good. And that's what I think you are doing, Jim, with this book, reading the church fathers. This is so important. All of you get a copy of this book. If you're not, you know, it's probably not an audio book yet, is it? I honestly don't know. That's a great question. It might, there might be a Kindle version. I'm not sure. I think um, there is actually, because we're doing this through Sophia press. And oh, I think, but there yeah, is a but Kindle you said version. audio. Yeah. I don't know if there's an audio or if there will be, but. Uh, okay. Because I, I yeah. always tell people, you know, go ahead and if you can't read it, listen to it, but yeah, go ahead and get, get it on Kindle, get a paperback. You can get the book at, um, well, you got a couple places. So you can go to Jim Papandria.com, but, or Dr. Jim's books, .com. That's where That one's going to take it. At Amazon. You said, right. That's Dr. right. That's Jim's my, uh, books. Dr. Jim's books.com is my Amazon author page, right? And that's whether I put D R Jim's books or D O C T O R Jim's books. Yep. It's going to take you to the same place. Either one, just no apostrophes or periods in the middle, but uh, yeah, that'll go right to uh, the page in Amazon with all my books. How many have you written about? Uh, over 20 now, I think. What? 
How old yeah. are you? You're too young How to How old am I? I just yeah. had a birthday and I'm not even years old. So, <laughs> okay, I'm yeah. 57. You got me beat yet? Oh, uh, yes, I'm older than you. You are? Yeah. Wow. Well, good for you. I only wrote one <laughs> book. And so, you know, 20 books, you're going to go ahead and, and get a lot more souls to heaven if they read those words too. Well, I hope so, but they got to read them first. So <laughs> they do. They do. Yeah. What are some other interesting titles you've written? Just we may as well promote some. Well, sure. Um, I've got a, uh, I've got a book that uh, is called What Really Happens After We Die. Um, it's about the, the, our, the historic doctrine of the resurrection of the body. So it's, it's not one of these like near death experiences or anything like that, but it's about the, the church's doctrine of the resurrection of the body. Um, I, and I've got one for the, for the sci-fi and superhero fans. I've got one called uh, From Star Wars to Superman, Christ Figures in Science Fiction and Superhero Films. Mm. Um, so uh, I write about a lot of different things. must like that, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and it's, it's really still all about Christology because it's all about Christ, but it talks about how it, even atheists who write science fiction and who write superhero stories can't help but put elements of the Christ right. story into their stories. And so I, uh, I go into that in kind of some detail. Yeah, that is exciting. Which one is, uh, which one do you find you get the most hits on? Which book do you find sells the best? Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure for sure, but probably whichever one is most recent. Like I think when I go on Amazon and it pops up sort of in order of popularity, that's usually like the most recent one is on yeah. the top, but uh, I don't tend to follow sales too much, sure. um, you know, because I'm, I'm always busy writing the next book. So, yeah. you know. well, God bless you. And, and, you know, may he inspire you to keep on getting in our heads and leading us closer to Christ through the wisdom he's given you. Well, thank you've you. really given me, I did not think I would actually be excited about this type of stuff when you, you know, again, I would have given you a different title, but, you know, reading the church fathers <laughs> sounds, sounds kind of academic, but this is interesting to me. Yeah. I don't know what we would have called it to make it seem more exciting, but, um, but I, I can tell you this, the publisher, when they, when they change the title to what really happens after we die, that title is more exciting than my original one. So they, they do their best, you know? Oh, I wasn't picking on them. I was just no, kind of like, know, uh, this is like, this is like reading the church fathers and getting the answers you always look for, you know, something like that. It's like, this is, it is filling it in the is blanks. An exciting story. Yes. Yeah. Uh, truth is more interesting than fiction. It really is. And so I hope each and every one of you guys watching will get a copy of this book, uh, Reading the Church Fathers. And again, go take a look at drjimsbooks.com and see what else that would appeal to you. But, you, you know, it is both of my, um, mine and Dr. Jim's goals to get you closer to heaven, get you in heaven. We don't want to get you close to it. It's not one of those you want to shoot and miss. Uh, we want to get you into heaven. And if studying, learning, understanding will get you to that next step, then the Lord will pass you off to the next person, get you to the next step. So, you know, it's your job to get your people to heaven as well, at least to try. So go ahead and get copies of these books um, and go to Jim. What will they find if they go to your website, jimpapandrea.com? Um, well, that's just sort of my homepage. And it, it, from there, it has links to my Amazon author page, my music so very page, similar. you know, my YouTube channel. Oh, yeah. So, music. Yeah. What kind of music? I meant to ask you that. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. Sim singer, songwriter, Catholic music, uh, not not liturgical. I don't do I don't do liturgy right. music. I do songs, you know. Um, and I also have a YouTube channel where I uh, I've got a series of things on there as well. So mm, do you sing for your students? Uh, I have. I don't do it regularly, but but it has happened on occasion. You could sing the Church Fathers. <laughs> I, you know what? <laughs> I have thought about trying to write a song uh, that would be about the Nicene Creed. I have not pulled it off yet, but we'll see what uh, God inspires me to do. Yeah. Well, God bless you. I I thank you so much for being on the show. You've really. Uh, I would take your class. You know. Oh well, thanks so. for having me. This is great. I'll come back anytime. Well, next time you have a book, look me up. You got my all email right. address. So all we'll right. go ahead and do that. For all of you watching, go to my website, breakfastwithbacon.com, and you can see other amazing guests like Jim that God has given me, uh, people who have written books, people who are, we've got priests, people, we've got canceled priests. We've had, um, I can't, every time I do this, I can't remember all the people that I've had, but um, really 
if you want to learn and grow in your faith, go to my website, breakfastwithbacon.com, and that'll connect you to all the other amazing people and, and their websites and what the Lord is doing and the, follow their charisms as well. But like me on my social media pages right here on this channel, Rumble, all those. And I always, I don't want to end on a negative note, but I've got to do this. You, It's trying not to make it negative is don't just be a passive receiver of information anymore. You have to start going after those people and those channels that you appreciate. So I am certain that my page, like many others, will no longer be on this channel. There's too much censorship. I've already had a show censored for speaking truth. And so, um, find mine, go to, if you like, you know, Dr. Jim stuff, any of those people go to their pages and start bookmarking. And when you find, you know, month, two months later, Oh, I haven't seen anything from so-and-so lately. Well, there might be a reason. So we're in this time in history where yeah, those kinds of things are happening. So go ahead and uh, subscribe to the, the pages of the people that you like. Okay. Including me. So I think that's enough and share the show with all your friends and family, but we're going to go off the air and Jim, I don't know if you remembered what I said. Okay. You do. Okay. We're going to do this. So to each and every one of you, I want to thank you for watching breakfast with bacon. I am Dr. Christine bacon. This is breakfast with bacon. And I want to remind you always to live your life. Sunny side up. Yes.